The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Karen Healy. Karen is a money coach expert at Women Talking Finance. Uh, Karen comes from a background of being a financial advisor, which she did for almost a decade and a half. And uh, I think we hear a lot of talk about money coaches, but there's still probably a fair bit of confusion out there about what they do, how they help. And um, I'm also keen to pick Karen's brain about how we can bring more coaching conversations into our relationships with clients. So Karen, thanks for joining us. Hi Ben, thanks for having me today. Look, it's um, something that's been getting a lot of attention, I think over the last few years that we're hearing more about money coaches, a bit, a few more money coaches sort of popping up online, um, a few more structured programs about uh, around money coaching as well, which uh, I feel like we'll talk a little bit more about as we go through today. But I think there is still a lot of you know, confusion out there uh, from myself uh, included. Can you maybe start by telling us what is it, what does a money coach actually do? Yeah, so it, it's important, I think, to start off with um, duality. And just like there's two sides to a dollar coin, there's actually two sides to managing our money. And as financial advisors, you work on the practical side of the coin, and that's things like cash flow, investing, superannuation, retirement planning. Those things are all external to us. But as a certified money coach, I work on the other side of the coin, which is that emotional side. So it's really around um, looking at a client's behaviours like emotional spending or not taking enough risk, as well as their, their mindset or their beliefs around what meaning have they attached to money. So money coaching is basically a bridge between two worlds, so the financial services industry and the field of psychology. And what we do is we recognise that the traditional financial advising is largely unable to solve what are essentially emotional and behavioural challenges that a client has uh, with money in their relationship. So you you kind of work on the the outer side of money and as a money coach, we work on the inner side, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think they're, they're definitely related. Like I know that I've seen it with a ton of clients that, you can crank your spreadsheets and models and show clients what is going to make them, you know, achieve their wealth goals or make them more money. But for for a lot of people, because there is so much psychology in, in making these decisions that people just end up sort of stuck and there might be something that's underlying that um, maybe isn't even conscious for them that then it holds them back from doing things, even when you can see, and it could be something like, uh, people overspending or, or struggling to save, or it could be something that where, where people are in a decent financial position, but they're just terrified of risk or making a mistake. And, um, yeah, it is, it is really paralyzing. So, um, I'm keen to unpack, um, 
you know, how how you go about tackling that and what we can do to to guide people through those conversations. But just before we get into that, how does it work from just from a technical um, point of view around licensing and, and advice? Like where where's the compliance line and how does that side of things work when it comes to money coaching? Yeah, so in the field of money coaching, it's not regulated. So anyone could practically set up their own money coaching shop. Um, I take a very different approach to that. So I think it's really important that some kind of certification is done around being a money coach. So it's very clear that you know the lines and the distinction between factual advice, general advice and financial advice. And we definitely play in the space of factual advice. Um, I myself am a licensed authorised representative of an AFSL, um, but just for general advice only. And that is really when I'm just uh, working on the education side. So actually empowering people with the knowledge of how particular financial concepts work. Um, but into the in the current landscape, there is no regulation around money coaches. Interesting. And so you would probably be more familiar with the the money coaches that are out there um, than I would be. Is it common that they would be uh, authorised reps and, and fall under general advice or do most of them have no um, sort of rep status? Most of them, pretty much all of the ones that I'm aware of and know don't have any licensing uh, at the moment. And I worked, um, I operated under Synchron for a couple of years and I was, out of all of their hundreds of ARs, I was the only one with a general advice licence. So I think it's a combination of um, either not wanting to go down the licensing route because I obviously still have PI and CPD points and all of the same regulations that financial advisors had. So there's there's that element to it, but then there's also... There's, there's not a lot of AFSLs that will take on a general advice um, mm. either, I imagine. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if the ASIC focus on the the uh, influencers sort of thing will might change the licensing around that for uh, people in this space in the future. I know that that's more of a social media and, and like uh, external thing, but I feel like a lot of the sort of same principles apply. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, Ben, at all. So, Karen, it, talking about like... Uh, people and and their behaviors and and thinking around money it, how does that how does that all sort of form like where does it start it starts in childhood ben so between the ages of 2 and 12 are uh, when we form all of our beliefs around money or some people call it uh, our money mindset so as children um, it goes back to the way that our brain is developed. So we have this amazing human brain and there's three elements to it. So we've got this primitive instinctive part of our brain. We've got an emotional part of our brain, which is a limbic system. And then we've got our rational, logical part of our brain, which is the neofrontal cortex. And that part of our brain isn't fully formed until between the ages of 21 and 24. And so that later part of forming our brain is where we make all of our rational and logical choices and decision-making processes. Until we're 21, 24, our brain isn't fully deformed. So when we realise that our money beliefs are formed between the ages of 2 and 12, it is with a very immature brain that is largely instinctual and emotional. And when it's instinctual, it is very much about fear and survival. And so it's very much about looking at our environment around us and what we need to do to fit in and feel safe for survival. And that can play out in different ways, but it, we are very heavily influenced by our family of origin and the environment that we grew up in. So if we had parents that were both savers, it would feel very normal and safe to be a saver yourself. And so you might develop those patterns of behaviors around saving money. Or if you grew up with parents that um, were both spenders, then that would be a very safe and natural behaviour for you to do. So all of our um, imprinting when it comes to money, the purpose of money, whether money's good or money's bad, all gets formed between the ages of 2 and 12. But they're, they're formed with a very immature brain that is very emotional. So it's not in a really good position to be able to make healthy or um, uh what's the word, accurate assessments of the situations that they find themselves in. So, um, 
yeah, we can have very flawed beliefs and mindset about money because it's created so early on in life, but it mm. forms part of our unconsciousness. And so we, we just, we have certain meanings about money that we attach to it that were formed perhaps of the age of six or seven, mm. but, um, they, they're actually very limiting to us, but they're also hidden to us. It's kind of like, um, totally. Yeah, exactly. So we have a, a conscious um, things that we do that we're very aware of, but then we also have subconscious things. So our physical and mental processes that kind of just run on autopilot. Um, and if you think about, you know, the act of breathing, when we breathe, we're not consciously breathing in and out. It's one of those unconscious things that we just do that our body just automatically does, like an automatic, you know, pilot just um, just happens. Our money mindset is just like another function of the automated nervous system. Um, and so we're not really conscious or aware of it, but we just do it. Yeah, it's I think that if you haven't um, had a lot of exposure to this stuff, it is often a, an, an unknown unknown. And um, I think I mentioned to you when we were chatting offline that I did a collaboration with a, a lady that was a, a breakthrough psychologist and she worked with people all around their limiting beliefs and behaviors. And it was only through that that I got exposed to it for the first time. And I I would see these things play out with clients um, prior to that. But I just thought, I'd, you know, people are just being a bit weird or that, you know, there's something there, but I don't know what it is. But when she started teaching me when we we're doing this collab about some of these limiting beliefs and how they can impact you, then it all started making sense. And after that, when I was seeing clients, I was like, oh, that's that one I can see is a, is a barrier for them. I sort of tried to bring it into some conversations, but obviously not with the same sort of structure that a uh, that an experienced coach would, would do, but found that to be quite helpful um, because, that, like, as you say, that, that people aren't always conscious of, of what's there. Tell us, Karen, yeah. what, what are the common what are the common things that like that you see that like the practical sort of um, issues or thinking sort of mistakes that that people make that impact their money uh, actions and decision making? Yeah, so Ben, it might be helpful if I share with the listeners a case study. So it's a client that I worked with, and it might kind of help bring it to life if I can. Sure. So um, I had a a client that came to work with me and the financial advisor had sent her to me because she was working with her and her husband and her husband was really engaged with all of the finances. He'd come along to the review meetings and she was just kind of, she would come sometimes, but just completely chippy checked out, barely listening. And, but most of the time she wouldn't even come. So the financial advisor encouraged her to come and see me. And so I took her through the process that I take clients on where we go, you know, deep into their financial timeline. And what we uncovered with her is that one of her first memories around money, for most people it's, you know, pocket money or school banking or nicking $2 out of mum's purse. Um, so we went through hers and what her experience was, was when she was nine years old, her family went shopping. So it was her, her mom, her dad, and her brother. And she was given a $50 note, um, which was a lot of money a long time ago. She's in her 30s now. Totally. Um, she, yeah, exactly. So she was given this $50 note. And so they all went shopping. She had it in her pocket. And her mum had bought a lipstick. She'd bought a toy. Her brother had bought a toy. And so they went to the counter to pay for it. And she put her hand in her pocket to get the money out. And the money was gone. And so the event that happened was her father got really angry. So rather than kind of being really nurturing and it's okay, it's just money, her father was so angry. It's like, how could you lose that money? <laughs> um, and what came out was that, you know, I should never let you look after the money. From now on, only a brother or I will look after money. And so this experience for her was deeply shameful and embarrassing and she disappointed her family. And so she took it on herself at that very young age that she, her now new belief about herself and money was that she can't be trusted with money. Someone else needs to look after it for me. That's interesting. I'm just thinking I've got a almost three-year-old daughter and um, she recently raided my coin jar and put all the money into her handbag and now she's got more money than I do. So I wonder what that's doing for her uh, her money police. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, um, going to be a millionaire or something hopefully that's right 
I could literally do a whole episode on how to parent your children around money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty. It is pretty amazing, and and I think that there there's so many different um, sort of ways that that can play out. Um, as I said, like one of the big things that I see for the clients that we're working with now is around this this ingrained fear of of making a decision and and taking action. And like they commonly when they're good at saving and they've got a whole bunch of money, but just so afraid of doing anything that puts that money at risk. And I think people recognize that they need to invest because saving money in a bank account is not going to be an effective wealth building strategy. But when it comes to actually doing it, they um, just get paralyzed and it's sort of then they start questioning different things. And it's almost like they're trying to come up with different different reasons or, or roadblocks that they can put in front of themselves to say why they shouldn't do it or, or shouldn't do something now. For people in that sort of um, situation, how would you how would you tackle it? Like, what could we do to to guide them through that process of, of building the confidence to pull the trigger on something they ultimately know is a good idea, but just have these subconscious issues at play? Yeah, that's right. So, look, there are a lot of different behaviours that can play out: um, avoidance, dealing with money, or being too afraid to take risk, so not doing anything at all, or giving their um, their financial responsibility to somebody else. The one specifically that you talk about in terms of just being afraid to make a decision, as an advisor, I think it's helpful to actually understand what is their greatest fear when it comes to money because fear is a big driver and motivator. So Mm. if we can uncover exactly what it is that the client is afraid of, then we can kind of address that rather than the external and say, look, just teaching them how um, about inflation and long-term investing and the returns that you can get versus leaving in the money in the bank. That's all very external to the client. We need to get internal about what specifically is your underlying fear around that. And when a client's not doing anything or what, not wanting to take risk, quite often underneath that, it's either um, it's a fear around making a mistake. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. And so what I want to do as a coach is I want to go back into the into the client's childhood and go back early on to find out where was the origin of um, of that come from. So by looking back into their childhood and different experiences and reflecting on when was the first time that they made a mistake and how was that responded to? So were they shamed for that? Were they embarrassed? Was um, Was it just not the right thing to do? Um, and it's about healing what the client experienced earlier on mm. and now giving them the resources as an adult that they didn't have as a child. And so how do, for an advisor, like how can we or like what should we do when we're seeing a, a client that you can see that there, there is some sort of subconscious block there um, sometimes it's it can be smaller, sometimes it's a bit more acute. Should we be looking to refer our clients to a money coach? Should we be looking to do more coaching ourselves? Should we build education around it? Or, yeah, what what's what what would be your tips there? Oh, Ben, all of the above. <laughs> 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 so, look, I I think um, it's very valuable for every financial advisor to go through the money coaching journey and experience yourself. I actually coach a lot of financial advisors and they're quite um, surprised as to what can be uncovered. So that client that I was talking about before that was shamed about losing money, she was in her 30s and this happened, you know, under the age of 12. She had no recollection. It wasn't until we actually explored and went through there that we found this money memory that she had that had been blocking her, like you said. So so um, referring to a money coach can be really helpful for clients that have got really deeply ingrained fears or anxiety or behaviours that aren't serving them well from a financial point of view. But For advisors that want to have a look and see how they can support the clients themselves, some really important questions that uh, you can ask your clients to do, and it can almost form part of your fact-finding process, is just get the client to reflect on, share three money memories from your childhood. And it's quite amazing what gets uncovered. Mm, I feel like that would be a good a good conversation starter as well uh, with clients, maybe a little bit heavy, I suppose, depending on what the memories are, but... That's right. So, um, you know, sometimes it could be, yeah, mum and dad worked really hard. We never saw them. 
uh, they we had everything that we wanted in terms of um, schooling and clothes and toys and all that, but we never got to see our parents. So you, you kind of ask them, well, how did that impact you and how has that shaped your beliefs and, and feelings and behaviours around money? Is it mm. something that you do yourself or is it something that you've decided you're going to do very different as a parent with your own child, children? So asking those three money memories uh, can, can really help uh, unlock some some motivations that the client has that you perhaps would otherwise be very unaware of, but it will explain a lot of things as to why the client does what they do. And and I'm not suggesting you go and ask these clients, eyeballing them across the room, oh, just share with me your first three money memories. Yeah. I think it's something that you need to give the client some time to reflect on. So it might be part of a, a pre-meeting or pre-review kind of the exercise that you get the clients to do and then send back to you. Interesting. And I, I, I um, feel like, yeah, for, for advisors that our our take on money or our views and, and philosophies around money tend to influence what our clients choose to do. Like you, I know for us that we've got a, we've got certain philosophies around how to invest money and how to choose investments and, and these sorts of things. Um, and then we build education in around those philosophies to our clients. And I, I suppose it, it's just if if people connect with them, then th those are the people that end up working with us. And then they tend to follow the same philosophies themselves. But I suppose I'm I'm thinking as you're talking and it's like how much of what our money beliefs are do you think flow through to what how we guide clients and how we advise them as advisors? I think they can, unless you have a really good awareness of your own, Ben, I think that they can heavily influence the way that you work with clients. So understanding your own beliefs and biases and behaviours is really important too because I am, um, and I, I'm no different to you, Ben, so um, I tend to attract clients that have similar challenges that I had. So uh, I was an emotional spender and I was through my 20s and 30s and perhaps even early 40s until I, I came across this work myself. So I tend to attract a lot of um, emotional spenders that, you know, they earn really good money, but they kind of don't know where it all goes and they they just seem to spend it all without knowing why. So I know that that is very much, um, there's inner challenges there that clients need to overcome. Me just sending them a, a spending spreadsheet or a budget isn't going to help or solve their problems that they've got internally. And so for advisors, how do we figure that out? How do we figure out what our beliefs are and, and how they might be impacting uh, how we're working with our clients? So you can go through the money coaching process yourself. That can be a really interesting eye opener. Or you could do what we talked about before, just for the financial advisor to actually um, reflect on their own childhood. You know, what are three things that you learned about money from mum? Or what are three things that you learned about money from dad? What significant events did you experience in your childhood? So did you go through a family divorce or um, did money flow really easily or was money really tight? Mm. And I think that awareness it's probably is, is the key there. I know that that was one of the things that I picked up from the learnings that I had around these limiting beliefs and um, awareness is a first step. And then it's like, well, what do you do to push through? So for, for advisors that recognise that there's something there or when we see that in our clients, what... What practically do um, can people do to move past what they recognise is something that's maybe a little bit, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think silly is probably not the word, but like, you know, maybe emotional or um, driven by our thinking as opposed to something that's fully logical. What where to, where to from there? So in, you're right, Ben. It very much does start with the awareness. Uh, and actually being able to see and observe, oh, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. So what's the motivation behind it? It's normally a protection mechanism or a survival mechanism for us that we created early on. And then it's about quite often, Ben, we have to unlearn what we learned as children. So if we saw that our parents weren't investors, they worked really hard or that um, their idea of wealth creation was buying properties and properties. And you and I both know that one of the key principles to investing is about diversification, but hmm. they've never invested in shares before. They don't know anything about shares. 
it's taking small but significant steps in the right direction. You don't want to overwhelm a client. So you don't want to say, look, you need to do this and you need to do that. It's about taking small steps along the way rather than taking those giant leaps. So it might be starting very small and it could be around um, firstly educating around whichever particular strategy or asset class you think is appropriate for them and getting them to start small so they feel comfortable with it before going all in. And I'm just thinking as you're talking, but is it is it maybe a, a, a thing that we should be looking back, like especially for clients that we've been working with for a while that maybe were suffering with some of this stuff at the start to maybe highlight some of those wins and then use that, as you say, to sort of unlearn some of those beliefs? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it is really about acknowledging people because we quite often are our own biggest critic and we're, you know, we're, we're humanly designed based on that instinctive primitive brain to be looking out for danger. And what that means is basically being very fear conscious and looking out for all the things that could go wrong. So we tend to be more negatively wired than positively wired. So it is about the advisor having the opportunity to acknowledge and say, look how far you've come over the last 12 months uh, and really celebrating and acknowledging that their progress as well, because we tend not to do that. Love it. I think that helps with with the sort of stuff that we're talking about here, but also just generally, I think that's something that we could all be better at, that I think it's a nature of um, generally advisors and our clients as well, that we're always forward looking and um, you always want to get to the next milestone and the next thing. But often when you measure backwards and say, okay, well, what's happened? And um, yeah, let's let's celebrate those wins. That gives you the motivation to keep going and, and keep following the, the path. So I think definitely, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, even outside of this, something that we could, could and should be doing uh, a little bit more of with our clients. Yeah, definitely. And I think also sometimes we need to go through a process of forgiveness, Ben. So I work with clients that are kind of like in their 30s, maybe 40s and like, oh, I should be better off than I am or I made this mistake with investing yeah. and I lost lots of money or I mm. spent all my money and not saved any of it. It's about well, we need to start with a, a fresh sheet of paper and this is where we are today and being able to forgive those mistakes that we've made in the past because it's not helpful to us and those energies and doubts get trapped in our body. So we need to release mm. them and let them go and just realise as, as all of us, we did the best we could with what we had at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing that it doesn't really matter where somebody is at, that they always think that they should have done something differently or better. Like our clients, I think, are probably younger um, than than the majority when it comes to advisor clients but we talk to people that are in their 20s and they're saying oh i wish i started when i was you know uh, 18 or 21 or something um, and we sort of think like you're, 20, wow. you're probably starting like 30 years ahead of like where the average aussie would be heavily focused on this stuff so absolutely uh, it's uh, such a different generational perspective isn't it definitely <laughs> Uh, Karen, thank you so much for sharing your your insights there. I think, so, yeah, super interesting stuff and definitely coming more into the spotlight, I think, uh, as advice progresses into uh, much more than just the, the the dollars and cents. For anyone that's keen to learn more about what you do or to, to learn more about how they can do more in this space themselves, um, what's the best way for them to reach out or what would you suggest? So people can reach out to me. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. I put lots of newsletters and articles there so they can they can reach out to me there at LinkedIn. The um the certified training in money coaching, there's one called the Money Coaching Institute, uh, which was founded by Deborah Price, and that's who I study with and I now train financial advisors in this space of money coaching uh, there as well. So you can go onto their website and have a look there. Uh, they have a 16-week full-blown certification course, which you really deep dive and get into the deep waters where you get coached yourself and you have a couple of clients that you pr have practice clients in and go through the whole framework of money coaching, which is a quite a unique four-step process. If you're not ready to delve in that deep, uh, you can go one backwards and we have a 10-week a uh, course that you can do online, which is live, and uh, they send uh, sorry ten CPD points attached to it. The AFA have given us some CPD accreditation for that, and that will give you a real good 
uh, insight as to what it is that money coaches do and how deep we dive in some of these emotions and things like clients' financial anxieties and fears and anxiousness and all of those different emotions that clients can experience around money and going back um, into their money story and biography. So um, there's that 10-week course um, that you could do, but um, people are always welcome to, to reach out to me. I get lots of financial advisors just um, having a little stalk on LinkedIn or sending me a message. So always happy to have a, a chat to advisors that are interested in this space, whether that they could integrate that into their own practice or whether or not they're looking to form a relationship with with um, a behavioral money coach that they can perhaps refer clients out to or that they want to get coached themselves. Awesome. I love it. Well, Karen, thanks again. Really appreciate you sharing your insights and we'll catch you on the next one. Wonderful. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. 